Without any further ado, join me in welcoming Paul Ralph. Thank you. So I want to tell you a couple of stories. Uh, first one I want to tell you about a story about a little boy named Gus. Gus is about 13 years old. He's a very inquisitive young man. Kind of reminds me of me. He's full of questions. Drives everybody crazy with all of his questions. Nobody can answer that he asks for hours. He's really interested in weather formations, Gus. Thunder clouds and storms and hurricanes and that kind of stuff. That's what really winds him up. And Gus has found a new girlfriend. His new girlfriend is named Siri. Not really, of course. Uh, but Gus really likes Siri because, see, Gus is autistic. And Siri is perfect for Gus in all sorts of ways. Siri never gets bored of Gus's incessant questions. Siri will talk to Gus for hours. Siri makes Gus speak more clearly because vo voice recognition, you know, isn't perfect. Uh, and like many autistic children, Gus speaks like he has a mouthful of marbles. It's very hard for him to enunciate clearly, but Gus really likes getting, having Siri answer all of his questions, and so it, it gets him to speak a bit more clearly. Siri never judges him, never gets upset at him for asking, uh, asking stranger questions that she can't answer. Siri gives him a little hell every time he uses a bit of bad language, you know, keeps him in check. Siri made Gus's life better in a way that we didn't really expect. I don't think anybody really expected. Computer scientists built Siri. Remember that. I want to tell you a second story. This story is about kidneys. So you have two kidneys, but you only need one. Uh, and so if your friend uh, needs a kidney, something goes wrong, he gets an accident or he gets sick, uh, you, can, you can donate your kidney to your friend, but only if you're a good match. So suppose James needs a kidney. And James' best friend is willing to give his kidney to James, but they're not a match. And suppose Will, in another city, also needs a kidney, and Will's best friend is also willing to give him a kidney, but he's not a match either. Now suppose that Will's best friend is a match for James, and James' best friend is a match for Will. Well, this is pretty simple, right? Just, just match them up, and one gives their kidney to this guy, and that one gives their kidney to that guy, and everybody, everybody wins. But now suppose that there are 40 people, all, who own, all of whom have donors, none of whom match the person they're willing to donate to. Professor Thomas Sanderholm uh, is a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And he saw this and thought, this is crazy. We can do something about this. And he built a system that takes these, analyzes these webs of people who need donations and people who are willing to donate and works out the optimal sequence of matches so that we maximize the number of people whose lives we save. A lot of people are alive today because of this program. Computer scientists built that. One more story. This one gets me right in the fields. Uh, it's about a 16-year-old. Uh, we don't know his name, so I'll just call him Walter. When Walter was four, uh, his dad brought home an Xbox. You know the old Xbox, the big clunky one, the first one? Brought home an Xbox. Uh, and they used to play all kinds of games together. One of the games that they used to play together was called Rally Sports Challenge. And uh, Walter really enjoyed this time with his father. And two years later, when Walter was six, his dad died. And he couldn't look at his Xbox anymore. He put it in a closet, didn't look at it again for 10 years. After 10 years, he went back pull the Xbox out, thought, ah, a bit of nostalgia, I'll hook this up and have another go. He played a few games, and he found the most interesting thing. See, in this game, Rally Sports Challenge, uh, you could do these, like, time trials, and it would save the best time from every time trial. But it didn't just save the time, it saved the path of the car. So you could race against this, like, ghost car. He found his dad's ghost in a game. He played against his dad's ghost, and his dad's ghost was pretty good. And it took him several days before he, could, before he could actually beat the ghost car. And when he did, he stopped just short of the finish line so that it wouldn't delete the save. That gets me. Computer scientists made that happen, made all the technology and all the stuff that went into that game that gave that guy that great experience. Computer science used to be about building custom electronics and programming and assembly and a lot of really hard math. And that's still there, and it's still really important. 
But a lot of computer science now isn't that so much anymore. It's about combining existing components in new and innovative ways to make people's lives better. Computer science is kind of rapidly becoming a people-focused social science instead of the kind of mix of math and engineering and hard science that it used to be. And this is driving a kind of democratization of society, of all different things in society. Democratization of everything, you might say. I'll give you some examples. So it used to be that if you had a great idea for a new business or a product that you wanted to make, you'd have to go to a venture capitalist. You have to find your own personal Scrooge McDuck with his big pile of gold. And you have to convince that guy that your idea is worth something and is worth a try. And so the super rich, the 1%, the venture capitalists, had an enormous amount of control over what got built, what got funded, and what you could do. And now we use Kickstarter. And we bring our ideas to the masses. And if lots and lots of people want something to happen, and they all put in a few bucks, then we make it happen. It used to be that if you wanted to buy something, you had to go to some massive corporation that treats their employees like crap, uh, that does all sorts of co co uh, corporate socially irresponsible things in the world, that has no sense of ethics, and that's where you had to buy your stuff. Because the other option was either you, do you don't buy it, or you buy it at some horrendously elevated price from someone who actually takes care of it, who does a good job in the world. Because the reason that corporations do so many bad things is because it lets them keep costs down. And then eBay showed up. Here it's trade me, but everywhere else it's eBay. <laughs> and these auction systems let you buy much of what you, what you need from just some other guy. You know, someone else who has it. Maybe someone who used something for a year and doesn't need it anymore. And now instead of sending it to the dump, you buy it from them. Or even, even a person who's running his own business. Or even like a small, the small businesses that operate primarily selling things through auction sites. Uh, these sort of small, I mean, small outfits are, are much different. Another example. It used to be when you went on vacation, you'd have to stay in some massive hotel run by some enormous company that has way too much money. Uh, that, again, doesn't do anything good for the world. And if you wanted to like, have your own hotel, well, that was, that was completely, you couldn't do that. That takes an enormous amount of money. There's no, normal people can't afford to do that. And now we have Airbnb. And anybody who's got a second or third room or owns like, an extra apartment or like, your parents pass away and they leave you a house, and instead of selling that house, you rent it out. You use it as your own personal hotel that you rent out. It used to be that if you needed to get from one place to another in a hurry, uh, you'd have to call a taxi. Uh, and this may not apply so much in this country, but in many countries, it is very difficult to get a taxi license. And there's an enormous amount of corruption around how taxi licenses are distributed. Because if there's too many of them, then no one makes any money. Uh, so they're a restricted thing. It got, it's so bad in the UK that a taxi license is, is like so valuable that it's like your retirement package if you're a taxi driver. Selling that taxi license, that's, that's your ticket out. So now we have Uber. Granted, Uber's got its flaws. Like all of these things have their flaws. But they create a system where just someone who has some extra time and knows how to drive and has an all right car can take part in this marketplace uh, where instead of working with some enormous faceless corporation, you're basically putting money in the pocket of some entrepreneur, some single person. It used to be that if you wanted to get a loan to buy a car or just a personal loan for something that you needed, um, you had to go to a loan shark or some scammy payday lender or even a bank, but a bank that, a bank that takes your money, borrows money from us, at like 1%. It's a bit better here. New Zealanders actually get interest on deposits. Uh, in Canada, where I grew up, the interest on a uh, current account is 0%. There, there is no interest. They don't even pretend anymore. It used to be like 0 0.05, you know? So they just, just some token interest, right? You get like 10 cents a year. Uh, but now it's just, ah, this is, this is silly. It's just there is no interest, right? 
so they they borrow money for you from you for nothing, uh, and then they lend that money back out at seven, eight, ten percent, and they just keep the split, you know, and they make a fortune. And now there are companies like Zopa that um, use mass collaboration to fund lenders. So they they take a loan and they split that loan across hundreds of lenders. Uh, so you decide that you want to lend a thousand dollars, and you lend a thousand dollars to a hundred different people to keep your risk low, and Instead of taking the whole spread, they just take a commission. I think they take was open they takes one point two five percent or something like that, uh, and you get the rest. Last one. It used to be that if you wanted to publish a book, you had to go to a publisher. You had to give them ninety percent plus of any royalties you might make. Uh, and what did they handle? Distribution, printing, things the internet made obsolete, and marketing. Except. Publishers don't really do any marketing, or at least none that's very effective. And now we don't have to worry about that anymore. You want to publish a book? You just go to Amazon, self-publish onto a Kindle, piece of cake. They take a small commission. You get like almost up to seventy percent of the revenue. And granted, Amazon's a big corporation, but it's a big corporation like eBay and like Uber and like Trade Me that that created a marketplace where regular people. Uh, could do things that used to be the realm of large corporations only. In each of these cases, power is transferred from a very small group to a group of rich people in large corporations back to the 99%, as they say now. And in each case, big business howls that this is unfair and unsafe, and you're not protected, or something. That they can't really define and don't really have any evidence for. Computer science is rapidly driving a monumental power shift back to the 99 percent, and this is something that is quite rarely recognized. I think computer science has become less about technology and technical expertise, and more about people. So here's my、uh, humble advice to you,、uh, as you're, I think most of you are finishing soon. If you want to feel like you made a difference in the world, focus on people, and not some abstract、uh, concept of people in general. Like, foc- find individual people with names that you know and faces you recognize, who have problems, and help those people. And that will give you a greater sense of accomplishment, and well-being, and personal victory than any high-paying job or fancy machine ever could. Thank you very much.